got Melvin, so do you know everybody? Give it up. Hello. Thank y'all. Y'all are super friendly. Just lost my speaking notes, so, uh, you know, root for me. So this talk's uh, called From Boot Camps to Contracts in Elixir. Um, from the title, you can probably tell that I'm a boot camp grad. And when I first got started looking into boot camps or wanting to code again, um, I saw I would go on YouTube and there'd be a lot of like super like high technical talks, but really I was more interested in like hearing some people's stories of like how they got to coding, and all that. So this is this talk I wish I would have seen, because um, I know there's probably a couple of people thinking about going to boot camps out there, and hopefully this might help them out. So this is one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite people: um, "You can't connect the dots looking forward; you could only connect them looking backwards." And I probably heard this when I was like 12 or 14 when I gave that Stanford talk. And I didn't realize how much this would be like my f one of my favorite quotes, like pretty much of all time. And my life is kind of an example of this. So who am I? I'm an entrepreneur. Um, started at a young age, probably 11, shoveling people's cars out of the snow. We'd make good money doing that. Uh, I'm an immigrant. I was born in the Dominican Republic. Um, Yo español. And also a farmer which that will come in handy later. I'm a jazz musician, um, which I think helped me learn, or learn to code in different ways. I'm also a web developer. So a lot of times when I mention that last part, especially when I'm talking to people thinking about getting into coding, is how do you get into it? Well, who remembers MySpace? Yeah. I got started coding um, <laughs> with the MySpace days back in the day. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, when I was 15, one of my best friends died uh, from brain cancer. And I actually used MySpace as a way to kind of deal with the fact that I was depressed. Um, I wanted a way to express myself. And coding, not even coding so much, it's HTML, but HTML and CSS were what I used to do. Um, and I used to charge my classmates money to just like make their MySpace pages look cool. So <laughs> that was the thing. Um, so that was back in 2005, and some people were like, whoa, 2005, that's like 15 years of experience. I'm like, I wish. <laughs> no. The, I had a MySpace business, and it didn't really last long, because, you know, Facebook. So this led to my first official pivot in life, Craigslist. <laughs> I love Craigslist. I have been in so many different industries. I've been a tree climber. I've done data entry, construction, translator. I've been a movie extra. So many different things. Craigslist has literally brought me all over the United States in some way, shape, or form. So this led to my next adventure of I, me answering a Craigslist ad for a salesman gig. And then next thing you know, I'm running their website and their marketing campaign and all that good stuff. And I made them a lot of money. And they gave me a chance, and I were fulfilled, or over-delivered. And that was fun. But this is where the MySpace came in handy. It really did. Because um, I had been practicing with HTML and CSS. So I started a social media marketing company. Um, I probably would have stayed on MySpace if that had lived. But I switched over to Facebook. And my niche was Shopify stores. So Shopify had an app store. And with that app store, a lot of what I had to do in my job was install the apps and make sure they were working. So that just meant plugging and playing like HTML and just manually testing. So um, just essentially being able to read HTML, super basic. Um, but the business was growing. I had a couple employees. And after about a year of this, I got an idea. I'm going to start a software company. I'm going to make e-commerce apps. And that should be easy, right? I didn't know how to code. <laughs> All I needed was HTML and CSS. All I needed was a technical co-founder. That's all I needed. And that's easy, right, finding one of those. Long story short, it didn't work out. But the seed had been planted. I was 21 years old at the time. And I really wasn't all that happy doing what I was doing. Um, I spent a lot of time working on whatever I was working on, just like marketing stuff. And I really wanted to do something different. So I pulled out my journal. And people thought it was crazy. I was like, why do you want to go over and start over in a completely new field? Um, I don't know. I just felt like I had to. I wasn't happy with what I was doing. So I go to my dream ah, my journal and look at my dreams list. And at the top was grow weed. Um, <laughs> these, 
These are my babies. Um, the one on the right's like 18 feet tall, and that that dude on the left's like 5'8". So that was what I did for a while. Like I really wanted to get into the medical cannabis industry in Northern California, and I did that for about seven years. I got really good at it. So after a couple of years of that, I started noticing some bud words in the industry, and one caught my attention. Another dot suddenly connected. Canatech. It's a magic word. Some of you might be thinking, what's that? Because that's what I asked myself. This is Canatech. <laughs> <laughs> that is what it is. That's what I originally thought it was. And I was like, whoa, I was probably just as excited as this dude. <laughs> Super excited. So I was inspired again. I was going to learn to code. I was going to be the technical co-founder. But notice a little gap over here. I was wondering how I was going to do that. And I was looking into boot camps, and there are a couple out there. I started looking into them, but I started asking myself what exactly makes a good coding boot camp. And I like to play devil's advocate sometimes and ask myself the opposite question that I'd normally ask. So I asked myself what makes a bad coding boot camp. And these are some of the things poor reviews, poor outcomes, outdated curriculums, toxic community, and no job hunting support. So these are pretty big, but I say the biggest one is lack of transparency, um, especially in their data. Um, sometimes their data is just outdated um, in terms of like what they're claiming uh, students are getting jobs or how quickly students are getting jobs if they're getting jobs. So it brings me back to what makes a good one. And usually what helps figure this out is if the boot camp has 100% transparency. So there's a site out there. Uh, there's certain organizations like SIR, uh, the Council on Integrity in Reports Reporting, um, that essentially hold boot camps accountable by making sure that 100% of the students' uh, data is pretty much verified. Like they're keeping track of all the students. They all have to be accounted for, and and account for for a couple of different uh, metrics, like how many graduated on time how many accepted a full-time job in a field they trained for within six months, how many secured part-time jobs, did the school itself hire any graduates, what are the salaries of the grads who started jobs in the field of study? Um, I think these are all important numbers. And, you know, that's the thing. So after looking around, I picked Turing. And Turing's a nonprofit, seven-month-long pro uh, program. And I loved it. I still love it. So if you ever want to talk about Turing, let me know. Um, what did I learn when I went to Turing? In the nine months I was there, well, I learned back-end development, Ruby on Rails, how deployment works, database stuff, test-driven development, and behavior-driven development. But I remember before, um, I could always see the curriculums online, but I never saw videos of people explaining like exactly how they went about learning the stuff. So for me, the biggest things were setting timers, 30-minute intervals, that usually works. The Pomodoro technique's pretty good. Uh, mentoring and teaching, Feynman technique, um, where you learn something, teach it, uh, tr fill in the gaps and watch and repeat. Um, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. That's super helpful. If you've never heard of that, definitely look into it. Um, next one's avoiding cognitive dings. So on average, if you're working on something and you get interrupted, it takes on average maybe 15 to 20 minutes to get back to the frame of mind you were before you were interrupted. So this is how things that should take you 10 minutes, like laundry, end up taking like three hours because your phone goes off, your computer goes off, and you just keep getting dinged. I call them dings. And I'd always just try to find material that kind of like spoke to me, whether it was a video or a different medium that would just work. And also uh, patience. Like seeds will become trees overnight. They just don't. So I used to play guitar. And that's a lot of the same kind of stuff I would do when I was learning to play my musical instrument, the same exact deal. So when I was learning Elixir, a lot of people asked me what I did to learn. And it was the same thing, setting timers, finding mentors, mentoring people, finding techie, OODA loop, all this kind of stuff. But really, I think what helped me the most were these three things. Uh, thinking in terms of everything is reduced, um, that's probably the easiest thing of this, it's not the easiest thing, but coming from OOP, um, when I started thinking in terms of everything being reduced, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it helped me shift my mindset. 
in terms of thinking that way. So next thing, books. So uh, programming Elixir and Elixir and Action are two very good ones. But I'd say one of the biggest things that helped me learn Elixir is the community. Um, we have a really good one in Denver, and they're always there for me in terms of whenever I have a problem. Like, I'll just slack them there. I'll literally have, like, a barrage of answers and replies within, like, an hour or two. So, to the fun part, I'm at a boot camp, I'm pretty much done, and I'm beginning my job hunting adventure. I'm going to go get one of those job things. So, this is where the farming came in handy. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite, another one of my favorite quotes. Whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. So me being at a boot camp and we're in a cohort, we're all job hunting at the same time, I started noticing that we're all kind of doing the same kind of things. And to me, that's not a red flag necessarily, but it's a time for me to just take a step back and look at what we're doing. So these are some of the things that came up for me or I thought were super important things to go over for other people who might be going through their job hunt. Um, first one is your mental health is important. <laughs> the job hunt can definitely feel like this because everyone's asking you, did you get a job yet? Did you get a job yet? And you're just like, yeah, I'm fine. Just like this guy. <laughs> but some of the tools I use for that to keep my spirits up, stoicism. One of my mentors back in 2010 got me into it. Um, there's also an app, Stoic Readings. It has like pretty much all the Stoic books. I highly recommend it. Um, it is definitely, I think, the biggest thing that helped keep me sane during the six months, six months of job hunting. So technical challenges. This is one I wish I had my notes for. Um, I think long story short, one of my thoughts on this were, um, I think this is one of the easiest parts of the job hunt in terms of being able to practice. This is the easiest one to practice. There are sites like Leak Code, um, Avid Code, Code Wars. I think my favorite one is Advent of Code. I highly recommend that one, um, mainly because the community is so great. They have dozens of videos online of people just doing Advent of Code problems. And I think that's a great thing to just be able to watch people solve the problems. And my whole philosophy was just watch as many of these videos and see as many different perspectives on these, because I feel half the thing to these technical challenges is essentially um, pattern recognition. And if you haven't seen a pattern before, it's just going to be a hard thing. So try to remember as many of the solutions as you can. People say don't do that. They might consider it cheating. But we, I think we could all agree that the interview process is broken. And the only way it's really going to change is if enough applicants start cheating the system and they start getting results that they don't like by doing the same things they've been doing forever. So that's just how I feel about it. Um, so spraying and praying, this is kind of a technique that a lot of folks do. I remember sending out 20 to 30 applications a week, going to two or three meetups a week, and it's definitely spraying and praying, and I was not really seeing any results. Um, this is where I started to get picky. After probably like a month of all of this and not hearing anything back, I'm like, well, how about I just switch? <laughs> I just switch and maybe just try applying to Elixir gigs. And it worked out. I started hearing back from probably 80% of the companies I applied to, and I didn't have to spray and pray anymore because um, I was applying to jobs that didn't have too many applicants. And I think that's something that we should be doing is looking, especially if uh, you just finished the boot camp and you're just trying to get your foot in the door, I think one of the easier ways is to pick a language that's not that popular and go do that for a while. Um, I just worked out for me. Um, so where the gigs at? Um, when I was looking into getting into Elixir, I was wondering about the job hunt stuff. And I was wondering where exactly do I go to find some of these jobs. Um, at ElixirConf, I met like five or six people who did not know um, that there was an Elixir Slack channel. So for the people out there, I mean, it sounds silly, but for the people just watching online or whatever, Elixir Slack channel is great. It's super active. Uh, Elixir Forum is also a good one, AngelList. I have to have the Slack channel in there twice. This is why I should edit things. Um, and then Platform Attack has a job radar as well. So there are plenty of places over there. And these are just the ones that help me get um, some of the positions that I have now. So people always wondered, uh, well, what kind of offers did you get? I got one in Arizona that I didn't take for a Ruby job. That was in the summer. I love Arizona in the winter, but I was not going to move down there in the summer. Um, 
I got two verbal offers from CTOs, um, but the CTOs wanted me, but it felt like the non-technical folks passed because my background was very non-traditional, but that was fine. I ended up finding three full-time contracts in the six months that I was looking around. Um, but I think what's important is, there's a quote from one of my mentors, um, if you really want to see the Elixir community grow and thrive for years to come, it's going to necessitate pa it's going to necessitate pathways for junior developers. Ramping up on a whole new language is hard for any developer, but people who have practiced learning a lot in a small period of time are exactly the kind of people you want on a fast-moving team. In the end, it's not about community service or what's ethically right. If your team and products are successful, it is a competitive advantage to be able to grow your own talent versus trying to outbid or outbenefit all the other great teams and companies in this room. So. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back. And looking back now, um, my space and technology changed the entire course of my life at the age of 15. And I would not have lived the life that I had now. And I would have not seen any of these things and the way it worked out um, back then. But looking back now, I can definitely see where all the dots and all the things that I did and how they connected. So you could absolutely learn the skills at a coding bootcamp. Imposter syndrome is real in any industry, and a job hunt is not super fun, but yeah, we all know that. <laughs> You're amazing, this community welcomes you, and don't forget you're already an expert in another field, and we need your perspectives. Um, we probably won't reach our full potential without you, and that goes out to pretty much everyone out there. And yeah, that is it. Um, yeah, questions? <laughs> So he was asking to tell him more about the statement that everything is reduce uh, or reducer. And for me, that came out of, like in OOP, we have, or in Ruby, for example, we have instance variables. So you have your state living somewhere else, and magically it just appears inside of your method. So in terms of thinking of reduce, it's, for me, is passing the state along into every function that you're doing. Instead of like manipulating some state somewhere else, like the state's being manipulated within the function, because it's actually there. And that's essentially what a reduce does. It has your accumulator, and it just keeps passing it around. And I think that's one of the <laughs> most fun, uh, fundamental things of functional programming. Could be wrong, um, but that's just what made everything click for me in terms of thinking about it that way, coming from OOP.